Most of us know it at this size, from the fish counters in the supermarket. The real thing can grow bigger than four feet. It travels thousands of miles to reach our shore and swim up our rivers. What I'm talking about is the magnificent wild Atlantic salmon. The life of a salmon starts in midwinter in the upper parts of the little rivers with pristine waters. When the eggs get spawned into nests that are called reds, the tiny fish have a sac that feeds them for the first few weeks. These ones, smaller than your little finger, are called fry. They really are small fry. After a year, their unique pattern appears and at two years, when they're six inches long, they get their beautiful silvery color. They feed on insects in the stream and herons and eels feed on them. They're now smolts and travel down river. Seawater is very different from fresh water and they spend some time to get accustomed to the salty water. Then they're off on a journey of thousands of miles to the cold Arctic part of the North Atlantic. They will usually return after one or two years and the longer the salmon feed in these rich waters, the bigger they return. The water temperature in the Atlantic is rising due to climate change and most scientists now believe that this contributes greatly to the decline of salmon stocks. Those that return have to dodge nets at sea, poachers and legitimate anglers to get back to the place where they were born. The last stretch up the rivers can take months and they stop feeding. When they arrive at their birthplace, they mate and spawn. Then most of them die. This has been their story for thousands of years. This is Loch Boyle, bordered on one side by Donegal and on the other by Northern Ireland. Each year, more than 30,000 wild salmon go through here, heading for the 18 rivers that flow into the estuary. The people in charge of protecting these salmon are the Loch's agency. I joined Art Nevin to see how this cross-border agency monitors the wild salmon numbers in the Foyle River Basin District, a vast area that includes a quarter of Donegal and one third of Northern Ireland. We monitor the fish stocks in a number of ways, uh, including fishermen's catch returns, electronic fish counters built across the river, uh, electrofishing surveys such as this. This technique temporarily stuns the fish so that they can be counted and measured. After we've electrofished them, we'll identify them to species so we'll tell whether they're salmon or trout. So this is a salmon nut plus, so it's salmon, uh, fry or young of the year. It allows us to get a snapshot throughout the large foil area. Uh, so we fish approximately four or 500 sites every year. So what about water pollution? Well, the fish are a very good environmental indicator of the water quality, but we also monitor the water quality of the rivers in the foil area. The Lux Agency used two methods really for testing water quality. Firstly, the biological assessment where we use a kick net here and we use that in the river to collect the little bugs. Um, the bugs are very important too because they are the food for the fish. Uh, we also um, lift a uh, water sample in a bottle uh, for the chemistry if you like and we take that back to the lab for analysis. So the different types of bugs or invertebrates tell you the, the quality of the water? There's a different array of bugs um, and each one can tell us a story about the water quality uh, whether it's good or bad. It's hard to believe that the salmon come up these tiny tributaries to lay their eggs. So Art, on a small stretch of river like this, what stage in the salmon's life occurs here? Well, everything, I guess, from spawning uh, to all the juvenile stages, and then the returning adult will stay here as well. Predominantly, it would be spawning and nursery area. So, the success of the next generation depends on the state of these little rivers. And what now do you do to reinstate a river like this? The first sort of uh, thing that's really important to do is to create fenced areas so the cattle can't walk through the river. So we've introduced these, these spawning size gravels, okay? And it can create both nursery and spawning habitat. As the eggs hatch out, they'll come down and there's more stone here that we've introduced. You know, a little bit bigger than the spawning gravels. And as the newly hatched out uh, Alvin and Fry come down here, they develop feeding territories here. So a deep still pool like this, Art, is this important? It's very important that uh, this deep water is here for the adult fish because obviously they couldn't survive in the shallower water. So really all stages in the life of the salmon are here? Oh yeah, this river has uh, got spawning areas for the, for, the, for the eggs. It's got the nursery area for the juvenile sort of fry and par, the small fish, you know. And then it's also got the deeper holding areas for the adult fish whenever they're returning. 
How much recreational fishermen are allowed to fish depends on the number of returning salmon. Catch and release is the preferred option, but all fish caught must be tagged and in 2007, a maximum of 25 tags were issued per fisherman. The fresh waters of the Foyle River entered the sea at Loch Foyle, which is a large marine estuary. Hello. I joined one of the patrol boats leaving from Derry. Yes indeed, my name is Barry Fox from the Loch Agency. Hi Barry. The main purpose of our patrolling is to protect the, the salmon migrating up the foil system. Um, we have a number of areas along the system and in the river catchments where fish will be targeted by poachers and our job really is to make sure that they get as little fish out of the system as possible. The guys that operate in, in the foil system would be very, very sophisticated. Um, basically they would monitor our radio frequencies, they would follow our cars, they would keep an eye on the agency offices to see what kind of activities we were doing. And they have, a, they have their own band on, on a shortwave radios that they can, they can let people know where we are and what we're doing. It is quite possible for, for a, an organised team to take anything between 100 200 fish in a night, which is quite a lucrative operation for them. Loch Foyle is a large estuary, bordered by Donegal on one side and Derry on the other. But who does it actually belong to? Well, that's an interesting question, Duncan. Um, there is no boundary uh, as such in Loch Foyle. No boundary? No. Um, from the agency's perspective, back in 1952, the, the two governments actually developed two identical pieces of legislation to allow the what was known then as the Foyle Fisheries Commission to actually manage the loch and the catchment area both north and south. The estuary is very shallow, about five metres deep. This allows water temperature to reach a balmy 20 degrees Celsius, which is unusually warm for Irish waters. One native species that loves this water temperature, besides ourselves, is the native flat oyster. We know that oysters have been fished in the loch for at least 500 years. Loch Foyle we recognise as one of the best oyster fisheries in Europe and without a doubt it, it produces the most wild oysters in Ireland. We have a large mussel fishery here as well. The oyster fishery will be a traditional fishery. Um, still fishermen make a very good living from it as where the mussel farming as such would be a business. Big business. Very big business. Loch Foyle oysters are famous and are highly prized in the five star restaurants in Spain and France. But they're also enjoyed locally. Now I'm going to see if these lock foil oysters are as good as they say. Oh, they are. Here, Stuart. 